At the end of uh, July this year, uh, a book will be published entitled The Great Betrayal. It's a book that deals with, a, that deals with a subject which unfortunately is, in my experience, not well known or understood, even in Spain. And yet it was a decisive period in Spanish history. The period which I am uh, describing is that inspiring heroic period when the Spanish working class rose up against a ferocious dictatorship, a fascist dictatorship, the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, which had slaughtered the Spanish people during the Civil War, and which sat upon their backs and dominated and exploited and oppressed them for a period of four decades. You see, in my experience, many people uh, know about the Spanish Civil War. They've studied it. They understood what, what happened, this clash between uh, the working class and fascism, where the workers were defeated because of the shameful policies of their, of their leaders. How many people were killed in the Spanish Civil War? Well, uh, nobody knows for sure. Uh, I've seen figures of up to uh, one million, perhaps. Half a million, certainly perished in the Civil War, and afterwards. You see, the slaughter and the killings and the tortures and the imprisonment did not cease with Franco's victory in 1939. The, the jails were full of prisoners, communists, socialists, anarchists, republicans, subjected to all kinds of bestial torture, murder. All the rights of the working class were completely suppressed. And the period which I'm describing, which I had the uh, honor and the privilege to, to participate in, in a modest way, I was present in Spain, throughout the events which I am describing, was a period when Spain was like a gigantic prison house. Just imagine, no rights, no, f no right to strike, no right to assembly, no right of opinion, no, no freedom of speech, no freedom to set up trade unions, no independent trade unions. There was the vertical trade union, the fascist trade union, the so-called, which is part of the state, in which the, both the employers and the workers, of course, were represented, uh, so, so to speak. And yet, in spite of this uh, colossal repression, in spite of the fear which undoubtedly did exist, you had an unprecedented movement from below of the working class, strike after strike, starting with the magnificent... Uh, Strikes in the Asturias, the coal miners' strikes, of the beginning, I think, in 1962. And thereafter, the strike movement continues every year, an increasing number of strikes, all of them illegal, all of them punished by the most brutal uh, repression that you can imagine. Sackings, imprisonment, torture, even death was what the workers faced. And yet you had strike after strike, general strike after general strike, culminating in the marvelous movements of the 1970s where I was uh, actually based in Spain for some years, I, I had the occasion to, 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 to witness this. Perhaps the, the, the culminating point was in the, the Basque town of Vitoria on the, on the 3rd of March, 1976. A massive general strike of all the workers, the small shops also shut in solidarity, the housewives participated. You actually had a Soviet in the uh, in Vito even the local employers denounced the fact that this was a local Soviet. It was, in fact, attended one of the meetings of this uh, marvelous uh, body. A general strike which culminated, of course, in, in a, a terrible tragedy on the evening, early evening of the 3rd of March. Thousands of people, men, women, children, old people, were gathered in the church of, of San Francisco, not to say their prayers, I might add. This was a Soviet. And the only place that one could meet in Spain in those days were in churches, convents, monasteries, and so on and so forth. They gathered in this church, the police allowed them. Vitoria was like uh, an armed camp. Police armed to the teeth, by the way, with automatic weapons. The police surrounded the church. They waited until everyone was inside. And then deliberately they fired gas canisters, smoke bomb ca canisters, through the windows of the church. Imagine the, the windows are shattered. The church is filled with thousands of people inside, filled with gas and smoke, 
and so on. People were terrified, panic broke out. And as the people came through the, the doors, choking for breath, the police opened fire with automatic weapons, instantly killing two workers and wounding, I don't know many how many others, I think five died and many others were, were wounded. That event in and of itself, the Vittoria massacre, could have been the sign for an all-out general strike in Spain, which would have finished the Franco regime, which was already on its last leg. Franco had died, of course, a few months earlier, in November 1975. There were other events, many events, which I detail in the book, which shows the enormous heroic struggle of the workers from below. That's something which is not generally known. And this is the problem. I find that people nowadays don't know about these tremendous events, not even in Spain. I would say particularly in Spain, and that's not an accident. Because the fact of the matter is that what you have in Spain is a kind of collective amnesia, which again is not an accident. This heroic page in the history of the Spanish working class has been blanked out deliberately. Why deliberately? In order to conceal the scandalous truth, which was that the people who should have been leading this movement, the leaders of the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, Felipe Gonzalez, Santiago Carillo and the others, conspired to put a stop to this movement to suffocate the movement, to prevent it from developing, in order to do a deal, which they did, with elements of the fascist regime. People like uh, Adolfo Suarez, who had been in his day the, 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 actually the secretary of the fascist movimiento, the only political party that existed. Mario Suarez, Adolfo Suarez now, they've even named an airport after him in Madrid. You fly into Madrid, you go to the Adolfo Suarez uh, airport. Of course, and the king of Spain, Juan Carlos, okay, this uh, gangster who's now portrayed, oh yes, he's portrayed generally as the savior of Spanish democracy, if you please. This king, who by the way, was the, his only claim to be king is that he was uh, nominated by Frank. He was appointed by Franco shortly before he died as his successor. This uh, corrupt individual, this gangster, this reactionary element, who, by the way, was behind the last element, the last episode, if you like, of the so-called transition, was the coup d'etat of fascist generals and uh, police and so on and so forth. On the 23rd of, of February 1981, they occupied the Congress in an attempt to carry through a fascist coup d'etat put the clock back. There's no doubt at all that one that Juan Carlos was behind this. I've said so at the time, I maintain it now. It's been demonstrated, all the facts are published in the book. And in spite, that, in spite of that fact, the leaders of the Socialist and Communist Party sold to the public and everyone else, everyone in his, in his uncle, that Juan Carlos the King had saved democracy. A complete lie, a complete falsification. And the entire history of this period is one great lie, one great falsification, one great fraud. Somebody described the Spanish democratic transition, so-called, as the, the biggest fraud in history. I think the, the fraud of the century, somebody said. That's about uh, accurate. What was the result of this fraud? What was approved at the end of the day was not democracy in any genuine sense that one could understand it, but it was the maintenance, the preservation of important elements of the old dictatorship, the old regime, the same old bureaucrats, the same old officials, the same old judges, the same old police chiefs, the same old army generals. Yes, the same old torturers who today are, are walking the, the streets of, of Madrid and Barcelona in complete freedom. They probably rub shoulders with the people that they tortured in the, the dungeons of the Franco regime. The, and the church, of course, the church conserves all of its riches, its power, its influence just as before. And on top of the lot, the monarchy. The biggest fraud of the lot, a monarchy which has nothing to do with uh, democracy, which has been imposed upon the Spanish people. They never had a chance to vote in a referendum, whether they wanted to, to live under a monarchy or not. And therefore, the whole of this uh, period has been hushed up in the most scandalous uh, fashion. Spain, if you like, it's a wonderful country. It's my second homeland after Wales. It is a beautiful country. Tourists go there, they see the beautiful beaches, 
the beautiful mountains, the scenery, the olive groves in the south, and the wine and so on and so forth. What they don't see is that beneath all this wonderful scenery, there's a cemetery, a massive cemetery. Hundreds of thousands of corpses lie beneath the soil of Spain, unburied, unnamed, unwanted, the victims of fascism. Now there is a big movement in Spain, I'm pleased to, to, to say, a new generation has emerged, finally, which wants to come to terms with this, that wants to know what happened, that wants to recover what they, what they call the historic memory, la memoria historica. I hope that in a modest way that my book will fulfill a role, both in Spain but particularly internationally, in explaining the facts of what occurred, because nobody knows what, it, what occurred at that time. What occurred, to put it in one simple word, was a revolution. Oh yes, this was a genuine working class revolution involving millions of workers under the most difficult conditions. There never was in the whole history of Europe, not in Mussolini's Italy, not in Hitler's uh, Germany. Did you ever see a movement of, of, of millions of workers under conditions of illegality? Strike after strike, general strike after general strike. And that's what finished the dictatorship, nothing else. Not the clever maneuvers and intrigues at the top and deals and consensus, none, none of that. It was the movement of the workers that destroyed the dictatorship. And yet, this marvelous movement at the end of the day was betrayed. The workers were robbed of the fruits of their struggles and their efforts and their sacrifices by the conduct, the disgraceful conduct of the uh, reformist and Stalinist uh, leaders of the Communist Party and the Socialist Party, which paid, uh, ultimately paid a price for their betrayals. Now the, the youth want to know, they want to know, and it's necessary that they should want to know, it's necessary that they should know because unless we draw the lessons of history, we'll never prepare the forces for the future, for the future conquest of power, which is the fundamental aim, or should be the fundamental aim of all genuine socialists and genuine communists and genuine revolutionaries. Comrades, we must study the past, we must study history, because, to quote the words of the great uh, American uh, philosopher George Santayana, he who does not learn from history will forever be condemned to repeat it. Comrades and friends, we do not want to repeat history. We must not repeat history. We must not repeat the defeats of the past, but prepare for future victory on the basis of a careful study of, of history to draw the lessons and prepare ourselves for the great historic events that impend.